thank you for coming anyway for this uh, special uh, conference. I am very pleased uh, to, to be able to organize uh, this event here. Yeah. I was told by uh, my colleagues in Thailand that this supposedly the first uh, conference on uh, the coup outside Thailand. So I don't know whether it's true, but anyway, we are really excited uh, to, to be able to do this today. today. Uh, the seminar today, the title is uh, the May uh, 2014 coup. As you know, that the military state yet another coup on the 22nd of May last year. Uh, and I just, I just want to take this opportunity, uh, the opportunity of uh, having uh, Ajahn Chan with, with us, and he would be departing Kyoto very soon. I think you have been here long, very long, long enough, maybe. <laughs> that we, I, I have to take that opportunity while he is here with us, together with uh, Ajahn Hong Chai, uh, who arrived in Kyoto uh, beginning of January, and he will be with us until June or July. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm very honored to have uh, my good friend Frederick Ho uh, coming from uh, City of Steel, Hong Kong uh, to join us. In fact, this is the same team that we did uh, in 2011 when we looked back at the coup of 2006. And that was the occasion of looking back at the five year of 2006 coup. Uh, we had a big conference in Singapore at the time. And uh, as I said, you know, all of us were there. The result of that uh, conference was a book. Uh, I have to do a mini pro promo promotion of my book, Kung uh, Fu Combat, uh, which uh, was out last year in June, just only a few a few weeks after the coup. So that really confused people because many people thought that the coup that I was talking about was the coup of 2014, yeah. and they 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 were really surprised that how come we could produce a book so quickly, only a few weeks after the coup, I said, no, 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 we have many coups. <laughs> and by the time we finish this talk, it could be another coup coming, right? Anyway, uh, so thank you so much for coming. I will just uh, go into, into the discussion uh, today. Uh, the title is the May 2014 coup, the ninth month of the ninth reign. Uh, this is exactly the ninth month after the coup, and it has, it's ex it, in fact, yesterday, Right, 22nd, uh, supposed to be exactly nine months. So we do it today, and uh, obviously in the nine rain, which is coming to an end. So it, it would be a good uh, good time to look back, you know, while we have a chance. And we have a uh, three excellent excellent uh, speaker. The first person would be a Professor Chan with the uh, In fact, he doesn't need any introduction. But briefly to say, he's former rector from South University and uh, right now he's a guest scholar at our center here. Second speaker would be Professor Kong Chai Vinich Kun uh, from uh, University of Wisconsin Madison. He's right now uh, the center, the center visiting research scholar. And the third speaker would be uh, Professor, as, as, as Assistant Professor Dr. Federico Ferrara from City University of Hong Kong. And I'll be, I'll be speaking the last. So, uh, without further ado, I would uh, pass on this to Ajahn Chan with, to, to talk about the coup. I guess that you would compare you know, the two twilight of when Journal Con and Puri Con. 15 minutes, thank you. So when you come, uh, usually when when we have a, a seminar like this, you know, they will say that oh, we can tell everybody to start first, you know, because you're this week. But actually, they said I mean, since you you're very old, you're supposed to start first. <laughs> okay, my uh, topic uh, is uh, quite like since I am in Thailand, uh, winter Thailand. To many of us academics of Thailand, the 2014 coup against King Lak was unexpected. I believe that many of us here were in Sydney uh, last time and we had a panel discussion on uh, politics in Thailand and most people wouldn't think about a coup coming. It was unlike the 2006-01 against Thaksin which most of us foresaw royal military intervention. Before May 22nd, the army head Prayut seemed to have good working relations with the first female 
Premier who was also the Defence Minister. Our questions are why another coup after all? Because the army head and the military establishment are not themselves, they have to listen to something above, or they want to be in the position to control in time of great transformation, the royal succession. Or they just misread the whole new global situation of the 21st century and of their own country. Or the military is still with the Cold War and the specter of Sri Tanarat. In order to understand present-day situation in Thailand, I'm giving you a, a comparative observation on the twilight years of the two reign. Uh, that is uh, Siam, King Tulalongkorn, uh, 1868-1910, uh, and Thailand, King Kumipon, since uh, 1946. The two are the longest in Thai history, and the latter is the longest in the world, as you all know. This is the flag of Siam and the coat of arms of Siam in the time of King Tulalongkorn, but it was changed to this tricolor and the Garuda. Tulalongkorn, as an absolute monarch, was 42. The king guided Siam into modernity, unifying and consolidating his version of absolutism. A turning point from traditional fragmented candlelight mandala Southeast Asian kingship to so-called absolute one is probably in 1886 when King Kula could solely appoint his eldest son, Prince Vajirunahit, as heir apparent of Sayam Makut Rajakuma. This is the title invented for the crown prince by King Kula his country, Siam, managed to escape Anglo-French colonialism, giving up its claim over parts of Cambodia, Laos, and Malaya. The king made two visits to civilized Europe and was well received by its global monarch and president in 1897 and 1907. It's King in Germany. Uh, the king with uh, Sir Nicholas II, uh, the king with Prince Bismarck in Germany. And this is something that I found and I like it so much that I have to show it to you. It's from an, a, a, a card, you know, uh, old card from the third of the century. And they have uh, head of state around the world, president and king. You know? uh, I picked up the one uh, on Japan, Matsuhito, you know, who came to the throne. Uh, I mean, he was, he became emperor February 13, 1867. Our King Tula Lankorn, with the elephant on the top, uh, was uh, king October 1868, roughly about the same time. Population of Japan was 46 million, and Siam was 5. And we believe that our standard of living during the time of King Tulalongkorn was better than uh, Japan. But not now. <laughs> However, in the latter years, his rule ran into a problem. There were three severe rebellions on the periphery of Siam, uh, in the northern part, Prayer, in the northeast, you know, the uh, Pumibun uh, uh, in Isan, and the Islamic chief of the seven Pakani Priyake all rose up in 1902 and had to be put down by Bangkok, modern armed force. In the last few years, his rule was shaken by family disunity and palace uh, politics, especially in the case of Khadi Raka. I think it is very well known among uh, lawyers. This was a scandal involving one actress, and it was between two high princes, uh, Prince Naratip, a half-brother of the king, and Prince Rapi, a son of the king who was also justice minister. The fight caused the son prince and a good number of judges to resign uh, en bloc. Polygamous uh, Jolalongkorn had 150 queens and concubines with 77 sons and daughters. The immediate royal family had become enormous and cumbersome. The throne went respectively to the two sons of the chief Queen Sawapa. Interestingly, Julian Gon chose to follow European style of 
royal succession through primogenitor or the right of the firstborn son to succeed. Therefore, bachelor Vajiravut became Rama the sixth. In early 1912, uh, just uh, over a year that uh, Vajiravut became king, there was a coup attempt against uh, the king, the new king. It was only a few months after the 1911 Chinese Revolution. There was some hint about republicanism among the coup plotter. And by the time of another son of uh, King Tulalongkorn, uh, Rama the Seven or King Prachatipo, uh, absolute monarchy came to an end in 1932. Uh, Rama the Sixth and Rama the Seven did not produce any male heir. It was. It is clear that Tulalongkorn immense barami or a Buddhist idea of risk of reserve power of 42, year, 42 years could hardly help it to successor. I think you're familiar with all these books. As for Bhumibon Rama the Ninth, a grandson of King Tulalongkorn through the line of the second queen, Sawamatana, he had been reigning for almost 69 years. The young king, with support from the Americans during the Cold War and the Soviet Tanong military regime, guided Thailand through the troubled time of the 1950s and 1970s. He and his queen, Sirikit, including the princess mother, helped put the country into international maps and at the same time constructed new monarchy which is neither absolute nor constitu constitution. Unlike other parts of Southeast Asia and East Asia, Bhumibon Thailand, uh, uh, it became Thai Thailand uh, in 1939 as you were aware. Uh, the country escaped communism and civil unrest of the 1970s. And by mid-1980, his reign, if not rule, is labeled as royal hegemony, Paracha Amnatnam. The king became so of the nation, his wish is more like a command to the military bureaucratic polity and its people. With his more than 4,000 royal initiated project, RIP, he is seen as a hard-working king dedicated to national development and to his people. The king has gained immense barami, somewhat equal to or even more than that of King Tulalongkorn. Unlike Tulalongkorn, Bhumibon has what been, but in his advanced year, the immediate royal family is not unlike that of the fifth reign. They have four children and several official and unofficial grandchildren. Prince Vachir born 1952, was appointed Sayam. Makut Raja Kumar, the same title that of, of the of Rama the Sixth, or heir apparent, the Crown Prince in 1972. The other three princesses were born in 1951, 55, 57. All four of them, especially the princesses, are extremely active in royal social function. The second daughter, Serin Thorn, unmarried is rather popular and her royal title has been highly and royally raised. The title is Safik with Sayam Rom Rajakumari, leading to misunderstanding that she is a crown princess. The royal family is now a center of the national attention and every evening at 8 o'clock, the cow, Naiparata Samnak, or news of the palace is aired on all free TV channel for a quarter of an hour. This has been in practice since mid-1960, when the new monarchy has been active, actively and successfully constructed. Things seem to go well at very high, but in 1997, Thailand witnessed a serious economic slump. The Thai currency crashed from one US dollar per 27 to one uh, to 50 is now around uh, 32 baht per US dollar. Political turmoil brought in a new force, new money, and new barami headed by Thaksin Jinglak, his family and his follower, the Red Church. The country has never been this divided. Uh, I, I 
I used the word uh, chon chan or class in quotation mark, but I think this is something that has to be discussed uh, of what's going on now in Thailand. In general, there are two old forces, old money and old barami, versus new forces and old bar new barami. There are yellow church, there are slim church, and uh, red church. As of now, the nation and the monarchy seem to face uncertain future. The 2006 coup failed to bring Thai Thailand back to normal. The situation is more worrying with the latest coup of uh, May 22nd last year. With this two coup, things do not seem to be business or politics as usual. Pumipon Thailand is now facing various problems. Some are not unlike those of uh, Jula Lampon, Siam. But many are new and previously unthinkable. For example, royal succession, male or female, rural discontent, especially in the north, the northeast, and political unrest in the deep south. Isan, Pakistan, and Pakistan. And not unlike the time of King Ramon. Plus underground and cyberspace, activism, and even the question of republicanism from international academic and press, as well as sizable overseas Thai in North America, Western Europe, Australia, New Zealand, and Asia, Japan, plus neighboring countries uh, in uh, ASEAN. In the meantime, the king had been in and out of Srirat Hospital uh, since September 2009. He has been occasionally, he has been seen occasionally in public, like receiving president President Obama, Premier, the Chinese Premier, and uh, Premier Abe uh, in January 2013. But by the end of 2014, the King did not appear as usual on radio nor TV for his December 5th birthday or reading New Year message for uh, 2015. His, late, his last public uh, latest public appearance was uh, January 13, or over a month ago. Uh, he was seen on a wheelchair, pushed around the hospital by the, by the Bangkok, Bangkok Noi Canal. Moreover, the Queen had also been admitted into the same hospital and not been seen since July 2012. One wonder if this are uh, sign of an exceptional twilight in Thailand. Uh, last word. In 1927, Prince Namrong, a chief minister and a, a grand historian, gave one of the most important lectures ever about Thai people and their country. At one point, the prince said, the Thai people have three important virtues that sustain Siam uh, to its present day. Uh, number one, love for national independence. Number two, toleration. And number three, power of assimilation. It's a great great grand uh, father of the present minister to the office of the Prime Minister, Mamlo Panatta. At the height of Anglo-French colonialism, Chulalongkorn Sai Air managed to survive external threat and remain uh, semi-independent. It was by bending with the wind from Great Britain and France. During World War II, the new 1932 government of Thailand played with the Japanese as well as the ally, and came out even by bending with the wind as well. When the Cold War started, Thailand became an intimate partner of the U.S. and the free world, <coughs> including Japan, fighting against external and internal communist threat. It emerged as a leading Southeast Asian nation in terms of economics and politics. But now, with internal rather than external threat, will King Wibon's Thailand managed successfully and survived this long crisis of proxy political war between the old Barami versus the new Barami. Will the three Thai virtue of love, of national independence, toleration, and power of assimilation work well for Siam then and for Thailand now? Thank you.
what I call a full perspective of the May 14, May 2014 coup in Thailand. Doesn't mean that all four are contradictory to one another. Uh, let, let's go over the four uh, perspectives or four analysis first, and at the end I will show what I think the combination or what are the relation among the four. These are the four. The number one we commonly, the common, number one is commonly found because it's easiest to see, it's easiest to understand. You can find across the board from academics to journalists, this is clear. Number two, number three, number four, I spend a little bit more time. Number one is that people keep saying that Thailand has so many constitutions, so many coups, which, are, which is true. But to put in that way, it seems like the current coup in 2014 is another recurring phenomenon of the cycle, nothing changed, nothing different. The fact is that this is a coup, one of a few coups which is much more repressive. Let's say, if I go over very quickly, in my view there are only three coups which are so repressive. 1957, 1976, and 2014. Most other coups are not as repressive. Among the three, they are different too. I mean, they're not equally the same, but let's say those three would be on the top tier of repressiveness. And then the rest of them are different. My argument and what I think is that because those three coups are especially reflect the fundamental or structural conflict in Thai society, whereas other coups are mostly factional fighting among the elite. So factional fighting among the elite doesn't mean they are less uh, less violent, they can be violent among themselves briefly, but it's not as repressive as long. But the structural contradiction in society means that there are deeper cause, and most of the time, especially those three ones, involve people, involve popular movement. <coughs> so repressiveness has to be more pervasive and stronger and take longer time. So that leads us to number two. Number two, by the way, I put it first. Royalists attempt to maintain its political dominance. What does it mean since we know that Thailand is democracy? I would argue that not quite true. Thailand is royalist democracy. It's oxymoron, I know, royalist but democracy, but I don't know what should be the word. So Put it this way first, then read the explanation, I don't have to talk much. There are a few times I use PowerPoint, so this is the time I don't want to talk. <laughs> so you can look at it. Since 1973 uprising, after which people often talk only one side of the outcome, which is popular democracy. People tend to overlook the other side of the, uh, the, other side of the outcome in tandem with popular democracy, which is the rise or the gradual rise of the royalists into political power. The royalists lost power since 1932, completely lost. Fifteen years after that, they cooperated with the army in 1947, state crew tried to come back. Successfully for five years, the army kicked them out. They revived the power again in, 19, in the coup 1957. This time, go slowly. The royalists gradually keep on the rise in power at the time, no political power in the Soviet regime, but with support from Sri and with support from the US. King Pumipon in particular gained more popularity, gained more what the judge we call Barami from the mid 60s to the early 70s. The uprising in 1973 was the opportunity for them to switch 
to change, to shift the power balance of power between the royalists and the military. From 1973, the military was on the way out, retreat. The, the royalists is, in, is on the way in. From 1992, there was another uprising. The military was completely out. Until 2006, the royal list was in control since 1992. What is that? Royalist democracy is parliamentary system in which the elected authorities under the domination of the royalist elite. So official news you hear about this and that government all the time. You hear this and that parliamentary legislation all the time. You hear it about politicians, the political parties. The fact is that no government since 1973, and especially since 1992, have their full authority. Their authority have to compromise, have to get approval in important things from the royalist elite whose power is always informal. They interfere, intervene in terms of major policies, major decisions, and powerful appointments, such as army chief, police chief, director of important departments such as irrigation department, local government department, pre preventive health care. Why? Because it's a lot of money. This position needs approval from the palace one way or the other. It's not official, but it's a fact. And a lot of time, most of the time, know this. But because they hate politicians so much, they think this is a good balance, good check and balance by the royalists. Then, good or not, up to you to think. So, since 73, especially 92, this is a full royalist democracy. The system benefits Bangkok of the old bourgeoisie, who led the revolution of rising in 1970, in 1973, 1992. The backbone of royalist democracy is the bureaucracy, including the military. That's why the royalists have to intervene in the appointment of the army chief of the time. Most of the time, doesn't have to be directly from the palace, but the agency of the palace is general plan for most of the time. Why this is an issue? Since 19, this is number three. Since 1980s, late 1980s, Thai society changed. Especially the rural society in the north and the northeast has changed. The result is that the emerging, instead of all, instead of peasantry, they become say my urban, say my rural population, which much better materialized, they are much better educated, much more entrepreneurial, and they rely less on the government. They become more politically involved because they want fairer chairs of resource and want decentralized political system. This is politicized 101. Society change and political system doesn't change in conflict. This is policy 101 teaching taught around the world the same thing. So the existing political system is the royalist democracy, still centralized by the bureaucracy, even though there is parliamentary move, parliamentary system working on. But ultimately, it is the political system that the royalist elite have in, uh, in full control. But political demography has changed. What do we call, somebody call, I'm not sure this word, but I use it for convenience sake. The new middle class find access to resource and political process via electoral democracy. To be clear, it means that bureaucracy, the centralized bureaucracy is an obstacle. Do they know that politicians are corrupt? I believe they know. But it worked. It worked better than the bureaucracy in terms of attending to their needs, in terms of bringing more opportunity, bringing more resource, or ultimately in sympathy, 
It works in the sense that every politician, because they want to respond to their constituency, they fight for a, a piece of the pie of the budget, right? Without those politicians, those pieces of the pie that go to the electorate, to the constituency, gone. It depends on the centralized democracy to, this, uh, to decide. So whether or not you call these people democratic, up to you. Bangkok elite call them the selfish. They want people who think about national interest. But democracy everywhere in the world, don't you think we're all selfish? Just make sure that nobody who are nobody among those selfish people have more power than the other. And make sure that everybody plays the same role and fair share. Right? That's democracy. In other words, to protect their own interests is nothing wrong, but for Thai Bangkok elite, those different constituencies who love politicians, they care only their own interests. It means they are not democratic. But for these people, they just play by the rule. They want one fair share of resources and fair share of the political power in the process. And they get it done via politicians. I don't say that, I never say that politicians are good, are wonderful, are excellent, are not corrupt. But this is the system. In other words, don't you think everywhere in the world, politicians are like that? I often ask a number of my friends, when is the last time politicians in Chicago is known as clean? Not yet. So, this is the change. Thaksin's success was primarily due to the awareness of the changing demography in rural society and the ability of his political machines to tap into the huge political reservoir, which is the new middle class before anybody else. <clears throat> so what appeared as taxi induced money to buy his mass supporters? In my view, you can change the word reality, that's my view, but I believe it's reality. This new middle class create opportunity for taxi's success. It's different. Sure, he used money. But money cannot buy mass supporters anymore. Long story, since around the mid-1990s, vote buying didn't work anymore. Doesn't mean they didn't use money. Every politician still used money up to the present day. But it didn't work. Buying vote did not work. In fact, this new middle class gave opportunity for anyone, doesn't have to be taxi. But it just happened to be a taxi who tapped into that political asset first before anybody else. In other words, this is number three. Changing political democracy, demo, demography and, uh, versus the resisting option, obstinate political system. Taxing as a politician, as a political power block, as a regime, as a phenomenon transgressed the royalist democracy. I believe this is the root of the conflict. Sorry for people who, some of you might have uh, read some of my articles. I have said, been saying this for four or five years. This is the root, the structural root of the conflict. And it's structural in the sense of beyond above and below the elite fighters, beyond Thaksin and this or that name. It is the changing demography which cannot be returned, cannot turn back the clock, it's impossible, versus the existing royalist democracy which try to resist the change. Again, Holy Science 101 tells us what should be changed. Number four. But the coup in 2006 and 2014 has another factor that triggered the crisis. I mean, the structural conflict is structural, meaning it doesn't have to explode this or that deal. It explosive, it becomes explosive in 2006, let's say in the mid 2000s onwards until now, because royal succession. I argue that 
Some people focus on royal succession alone, including people like Andrew McGregor, Marshall, or more many people like Jesuit, focus on royal succession alone. Royal succession, without, I mean, if without royalist democracy, royal succession, let them argue, let them fight. Nobody cares. But in Thailand, because royal succession is not only the change of the people on the throne, it means that it could lead to the crumbling or the continuing success of royalist democracy. That's why royal succession is so important. Let's say, suppose in British monarchy, suppose there are two or three sons fighting for the throne. I think people would gossip, 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 and let them fight. Because it doesn't have any effect. But in Thailand, it has effect because royalist democracy. Because whoever becomes the king is so critical, important for the survival, success, or crumbling of the royalist democracy, which means power and huge wealth. That's so important. Royalist democracy built around charismatic virtuous Barami of King Pumipun and the related hyper royalist culture for 50, 60 years. Without suitable monarch, royalist domination would be over. So while the success issue must be resolved among royalists, political conditions must be under their control, meaning no competing kingmakers. No anti-monarchy elements in Thai society. 2006 was the first one tried to secure this situation. But in the jargon and rhetoric of the royalists, as they say now, 2006 is not resolute enough. It's not definitive enough. It backfired. That's why 2014 must be more repressive, must be more resolute in order to prepare for the succession. This is how I see the four perspective or four explanation related. Number one is just phenomenon. What we see as military versus civilian uh, struggle for democracy is just phenomenon. It's just a it phenomenon, it's manifestation. Unlike previous school, maybe similar to a few previous schools, but in most other schools are not like this. Because the current school has number two, three, and four, which is changing demography versus existing political system that try to resist the change and trigger by royal succession. In short, in the medium, in the short term, or in the long term. What would happen if royalists succeed? What would happen if they don't? I don't have time, and I think we sh I should leave this for you to think. It is a big change right now. It is a historic moment. Either way, no matter what. I just have number five. I just about it last night, and this is it. Is, this is another question that I, I'm going to talk elsewhere uh, in, in a few months. Is the political crisis in Thailand is a setback of democratization? Or it is a growing pain of democratization? In my view, is it possibly both? Meaning, this, this moment is a historic moment because the suspension between the two is still hanging in the middle. It depends on historical agency. To push it one way as a pain, growing pain of democratization or as a retreat of democratization. That's why at this critical moment, it may need the whole world to prevent a setback. Democracy is not inevit inevitable, no. Democracy is on, is hanging on the balance. Depends on how we act. Depends on how we fight. Thank you. Uh, wow.
Frederick Bo is preparing for this PowerPoint. I just want to make a mini announcement. Uh, Dr. Frederick Bo, his book, his latest book will be out very soon, uh, perhaps next month. Okay, and the title of his uh, latest book is uh, The Political Development of Modern Thailand, published by uh, Cambridge University Press. I don't know whether it would, it would be banned in Thailand, but that would uh, be good for the book. Good for the book. <laughs> Thailand might just have uh, muted their television sets when General Prayut Chan Ocha appeared live on the air on the afternoon of May 22nd, 2014. The reason is that they had heard it all before. The Army Commander-in-Chief read a brief statement announcing that the National Council for Peace and Order, NCPO, had seized administrative power, putting an end to the country's later three-year spell of at least electoral democracy. The themes that were referenced in the statement, the first couple of paragraphs of which are on this slide, had already featured in basically all of the ten or so successful coups that were staged, that have been staged during the reign of King Pumipon. Uh, the, the junta's first pronouncement uh, spoke of the great dangers that might result from a further escalation in the violence that had broken out over the previous six months as royalist street protesters had sought to overthrow an embattled elected government that they had already prevented in, con in concert with the courts and so-called independent agencies from maintaining order and holding new elections. The standoff had been already cost the lives of some 28 people. The NCPO pledged to restore a semblance of normality uphold the monarchy, enact unspecified reforms, and make, quote, love of unity spring from the nation's people as it did before. Oh boy, that's the part in, in Greek. Uh, days later, an NCPO spoke, spokesman uh, spoke, uh, no, added that in contrast with other countries, democracy in Thailand had caused losses from Sunsia. Uh, General Payut echoed the same theme in a press conference the following day when he refused to say when or on what terms an election would be organized, reiterating that his first priority was to heal the country's deep political divisions. So far, so coup d'etat. Uh, indeed, while the NCPO spokesman, uh, this fellow here, uh, did not fail to trot out the old royalist cliché about Thailand being somehow unique, and hence, presumably, exempt from the standards that apply to less exceptional countries, there was nothing terribly unique about the last coup's rationalization, um, which relied on some pretext that few military juntas have missed a chance to highlight over the last century or so in Thailand and elsewhere. Even so, Thailand's history of military coups, or royalist military coups, has at least two outstanding features. The first is that the central theme uh, that uh, was emphasized in each of these coups, a generalized abhorrence for the disagreement, disunity, and disorder permitted under democratic rule, is at the heart of the country's official ideology, a hierarchical royal nationalism that was formulated during the, state, uh, the country's state-building process at the turn of the uh, 20th century, retooled and rendered uh, culturally hegemonic under the dictatorship of Field Marshal Sarit, uh, revised and propagandized to saturation levels since the late 1970s, and increasingly challenged in the new millennium as a combined result of social change and the rise of elected politicians. The second outstanding feature is that royalists have, at times, generally taken it upon themselves to make sure that the prophecy of their guiding ideology, namely, the axiom that democracy leads to anarchy and chaos, would actually come to be fulfilled whenever the Thai people shrugged off their warnings and rejected their tutelage. Indeed, all royalist rationalizations of the last two studiously omit the fact that the military had actually helped engineer the conditions of ingovernability that were cited by the NCPO to justify the suspension of electoral democracy. We don't know if Sutet Tuxuban actually spoke the truth 
when he boasted month after the coup that he had conspired with General Payuk to overthrow the system since 2010. But the behavior of the armed forces in the intervening four years had left very little doubt as to whose side their chiefs had taken. In 2010, when Suteg was a deputy prime minister in a royalist government established after a series of controversial judicial rulings, the armed forces did not hesitate to open fire on thousands of redshirt protesters who had taken to the streets to demand an early election. Less than four years later, the military did nothing to prevent Suteg's People's Committee to change Thailand into an absolute democracy with the king as head of state. By the, by the way, to translate it further into English, Absolute democracy with the king as head of state means a system of government with, where elections don't matter, dissent is crushed in the name of unity, and everybody loves the king, spontaneously, of course. Uh, so the military did nothing to prevent Sutet and his uh, people from violently disrupting a general election on uh, the 2nd of February 2014. It is also telling that upon seizing power, General Kayuk not only filled key advisory positions with retired generals who were rumored or reported to have been behind the protests in the first place, uh, but also sought to give the impression that the NCPO had stepped in to prevent or to stop an escalation of the violence. This was actually a misrepresentation, a deliberate misrepresentation, as the violence had in fact dropped off quite sharply since uh, its peak in February. At the end of the day, the NCPO did not act to prevent disorder from spiraling out, out of control, on the contrary, it only acted once it became clear that the disorder that military officers had orchestrated with Suteg's royalist protesters had failed to bring down an elected government that had proven uncharacteristically resilient to the onslaught of royalists in the streets, the courts, and the bureaucracy. The long-standing tendency of Thailand's royalist establishment to cite the threat of chaos, or when, is that, when that is not enough, actually engineer the chaos themselves, uh, in order to make the suspension, I guess, of electoral democracy appear necessary to restoring or maintaining order, calls to mind an analogy that was drawn by the late historian and sociologist Charles Tilly between state-making and organized crime. Uh, indeed, while authoritarian regimes uh, especially almost always base their claims uh, to power on their capacity to protect the population from both external and internal dangers, Tilly reminds us that it's often the same actors that take it upon themselves to simulate, uh, stimulate, or even fabricate such threats. In turn, to the extent that uh, threats against which a given government protects its citizens are imaginary or are the consequences of its own activities, Tilly concluded, the government has organized a protection racket. Thailand, to be sure, is not the only country where the workings of the state have at times resembled those of a protection racket. There, however, the phenomenon takes special significance for its sheer ubiquity in the succession of 13 coups and 19 constitutions the country has experienced since 1932, as well as for the practice's close, close connection to uh, the royal nationalism that returned to serve as the state's official ideology in the late 1950s. Indeed, a discussion of the tendency of Thailand's royalist establishment to run the state like a protection racket illuminates some important aspects of the country's ongoing political conflict. The first such aspect is that the longevity of Thailand's royalist political order, despite the fragmentation uh, that is known to have plagued the country's ruling class since its founding. In a recent study of authoritarian regimes uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, Dan Slater uh, described the strong states and stable regimes that were built in Malaysia and Singapore as a product of what he called a protection pact that joined those countries' urban middle classes with uh, state, communal, and economic elites, a coalition that was held together by the common goal of forswearing a revolutionary threat from below. In Thailand, conversely, successive authoritarian regimes that were established after World War II have been supported by less cohesive and uh, ultimately less durable coalitions which have proven vulnerable to the willingness of the monarchy, the capitalist bourgeoisie, and the urban middle class frequently to pursue their ambitions of status and power at the military's expense. Significantly also, urban elites were never asked to submit to rates of direct taxation high enough to permit the construction of a strong state and a durable governing party, 
While institutions like the military and the monarchy have most commonly treated the state's treasury as a slush fund for their own enrichment and ag aggrandizement. Even so, Thailand's state, commun communal, and economic elites have never really lacked the motivation and unity of purpose to subvert democratic institutions whenever their interests and prerogatives were at stake. Elected governments that failed to bend to the will of the royalist establishment have been removed in military coups that have been invariably justified on the basis of contrived threats to the nation and the monarchy. And, significantly, in instances where simply referencing such threats would likely not have sufficed for the people of Thailand to surrender voluntarily their individual freedoms, royalists in the palace, the military, and the bureaucracy did not hesitate to create the conditions of chaos and ingovernability designed to impress upon key segments of the population, above all the urban middle class, that they could ill afford uh, to support democratic regimes or regimes uh, in general not subject to the tutelage of the royalist establishment. Now this modus operandi is no doubt more reminiscent of a protection racket than a protection pact, but it has worked just as well to guarantee the survival of Thailand's royalist order despite the ups and downs of its formal constitutional structure. Uh, the second such aspect is the state of crisis in which Thailand's royalist order has been thrust over the past decade, its secular decline being at the core of the political strife that the country has experienced since 2006. With one major exception in the mid-1970s, as the slide, uh, uh, not says, but reproduces a few images from that period. So with one major exception in the mid-70s, in which royalists went so far as to organize death squads that destabilized a fragile democratic regime in a campaign of assassinations, bombings, and mob lynchings that culminated in gruesome massacre at Thammasat University. From the late 1950s until quite recently, royalists have most often, not always, but most often, only needed to reference in varying degrees of detail, invented or overblown threats to the nation and the monarchy in order to secure the public's acquiescence to authoritarian reversals or coups that were blessed by the king. The fact that over the past decade, royalists have been forced uh, to inflict on the country increasing levels of chaos and economic damage in order to pave the way for the military or the courts to remove elected governments uh, think uh, airport occupations in 2008 and Bangkok shutdown in 2014, only to have to do so again uh, just a few years later shows that something is broken and perhaps irreparably broken in the royalist political order that was established by King Pumipon and Field Marshal Sari. Uh, Thailand's new season of military dictatorship has shown in restrictions to civil and political rights that have not been seen in the wake of military coups dating back to 1976. The NCPO has banned all dissent and has prosecuted a campaign of censorship and arbitrary detentions in order to disrupt all organized oppositions. Meanwhile, the proposals for reform that have already been announced or floated in the press indicate that the NCPO only plans to restore civilian rule once it is satisfied that no civilian government will ever be in a position to challenge a revitalized royalist order. To be bolstered, according to its own supporters, and this is where the quote uh, comes in, uh, by the re-socialization of ordinary people into, quote-unquote, the submission culture. Until then, the country will be ruled according to the provisions of an interim constitution that gives General Payut, like Phil Marshall Sarit before him, the power to take any actions he sees fit, irrespective of any existing laws, in order to enforce order and unity. It is hardly a coincidence that one has to go back as far as 1976-77 in order to find a royalist regime that is more oppressive. Uh, after all, uh, not since the mid-1970s has Thailand royalist order experienced a crisis of faith as deep or as generalized as the current one. Now as it was then, the crisis is rooted in the failure of the country's royal nationalism to persuade the population spontaneously to welcome the tutelage of the royalist establishment, or unelected institutions in general. The escalating severity of the measures that royalists have taken over the past several years, in this sense, 
is but a reflection of their fading legitimacy and moral authority. If royalists could still count on their powers of persuasion, they would not have relied on censorship, less not just this, street violence, military firepower, outlandish court rulings, as heavily or as frequently as they have over the past nine years. Worse still, the extreme remedies that royalists have taken since 2006 to compensate for their declining cultural hegemony have only served to antagonize much of the voting public, uh, thereby eroding their authority further. The monarchy, upon which the legitimacy of the status quo rests, has sustained the most damage on this count, as the constant invocation of the need to protect the institution to justify the undoing of results uh, produced by the democratic process has weathered down its once glistening facade. As the ninth reign has been uh, slowly coming to a close, in fact, the Thai monarchy increasingly resembles the white elephant that has long served as one of its symbols, an institution that combines a lack of clear practical purpose with exorbitant cost of protection and maintenance as measured in blood, treasure, and individual freedoms. In turn, the aggressiveness with which the military has suppressed all dissent after the 2014 coup, going so far as to criminalize the symbolic hand gestures flashed by small crowds of protesters, betrays its anxiousness to deny any oxygen to the faintest flame of resistance, grounded in well-founded insecurities about the effectiveness of the usual rationalizations which is generally protect the monarchy. As it did in 1976, the combination of pre-coup disorder and post-coup repression has for the time being managed to secure the public's acquiescence. The events that followed the, 70, that followed the 76 coup, however, also demonstrate that the methods of racketeers and tyrants are of little use in overcoming what is at its core a crisis of legitimacy. Indeed, just as the policies of uh, Tanin, Tanin uh, Kaivichian eventually alienated constituencies, the officialdom and the urban middle class whose support it could not afford to lose, the NCPO's continued reliance on current levels of repression threatens eventually to compromise middle class support, aggravate divisions known to exist within the military and the palace, and send General Prayut, uh, Prayut's happy band of allies, flatterers, and enablers scrambling for the exits. Unfortunately for the junta, uh, its efforts to revive royal nationalism face equally daunting challenges. For one thing, its attempts to re-educate the public to embrace its own submission are complicated not only by the constraints that the information age places on its ability to crowd out alternative ideas, but also by the Thai public's increased political awareness and sophistication. Provincial voters in particular are not likely to take kindly to so-called reforms designed to deny them a chance freely to choose their own governments, no matter how much royalist propaganda is directed at them. In the longer run, royal nationalism faces a mortal danger in the succession of the country's 87-year-old monarch, because upon its death, there will be no one left in Thailand under whose royal feet enough people will still be, wish to be enslaved for all future rebirths, as recited in a vow of submission that royalists can still be heard making to King Pumipon. Just Google it. Uh, having uh, previously failed to extinguish popular demands for greater democracy, even at the height of its, of its powers, is it doubtful that royal nationalism will ever again stand a chance of doing so in the future? And in the absence of alternative sources or basis of legitimacy, the denial of democracy requires royalists to insist on current levels of repression, the drawbacks of which have already been noted. Uh, 500 years ago, my uh, uh, compatriot, or <laughs> I, I guess not compatriot, but uh, uh, Machiavelli poured scorn on what he called unarmed pro prophets. And he was trying to make the point essentially that autocrats who are uh, determined to die in their own beds had better not place too much faith in their power of persuasion, always making sure that their words are backed up by the force of arms. The vicissitudes of Thailand's royalist uh, order illustrate both the enduring value of Machiavelli's advice as well as the dangers of taking it too far. 
The longevity of their control of the state, in fact, owes much to the capacity exhibited by royalists, started, starting with Vilma Chosari, uh, to use their powers of persuasion and coercion in a complementary fashion. Because if the cultural hegemony of the royal nationalism has long kept the need for coercion to a minimum, boosting in turn the perceived benevolence of their rule, and hence their powers of persuasion, coercion, both physical and legal, has been instrumental in protecting their ideological dominance, as well as in occasionally overcoming its limitations. In normal times, royalists had never shied away from making use of coercion to silence or isolate dissenting voices. In times of crisis, state violence, military coups, and the artifices of organized crime have often helped beat back the most serious challenges. Even so, the half century since the death of Field Marshal Sarit is also interspersed with episodes in which the application of excessively harsh or sustained levels of repression has backfired, fractured authoritarian coalitions, and prompted royalists eventually to change course. Indeed, the events of the past decade show that when armed prophets, not unarmed prophets, but armed prophets, are compelled by the declining effectiveness of their powers of persuasion to rely too heavily on the force of arms, they risk becoming ensnared in a vicious cycle where the loss of legitimacy that results from the unpopularity of repression only increases the need for repression, which further harms their legitimacy. Ultimately, this death spiral ends with the unmasking of prophets as racketeers and tyrants, exposing them to the full range of professional hazards that are attendant to living entirely by the sword. Thailand's royalists have already traveled some distance down this road. It remains to be seen how much farther they will go before realizing that it leads to the destruction of everything they profess to treasure. Thank you. Okay, uh, from, from quite a different perspective on the coup of 2014, uh, whereas the previous three speakers focused mainly on uh, domestic politics, I will also shed some light on the uh, foreign, foreign relations of Thailand, especially the past nine months. Uh, what has uh, the Prayut government been doing and the impact on Thailand's relation with uh, key powers in the region and, and at the international level and also the impact on Thailand domestic politics. Uh, as we know, uh, the, the, the military state approved on the uh, 22nd of May last year and basically it claimed uh, to restore peace and, and order after months of protestations against the elected government of Prime Minister in Lakshinova. So immediately after the, the coup, uh, an army of Western countries voiced their concern about the uh, disappearance of democratic space and subsequently uh, they imposed what I, I would see as soft sanction uh, against the, the junta. I will start by uh, uh, looking into the case of uh, the United States and the, uh, the soft sanction against uh, the Thai military government. Uh, in the case of the U.S., uh, as a treaty ally of, of Thailand, uh, military allies of Thailand, and according to uh, the U.S., the American, American law, uh, the U.S. is obliged to uh, penalize the Thai junta for undertaking a coup that overthrew uh, an elected government. And this is true uh, with regards to any country receiving military aid from the United States when it experiences a coup. So what I'm trying to say is that this is not particularly unique about the Thai case, the U.S. could have done it, would have done it to any other case, uh, especially uh, if that country uh, has some sort of, you know, allied treaty with the United States. So, uh, on, on the day of the coup, on the 22nd of May, the U.S. Secretary of State, John Kerry, uh, Okay, uh, on the 22nd, 22nd of May, uh, John Kerry, the, the, the Secretary of State, said in a statement that I am disappointed by the decision of the Thai military to suspend the constitution and take control of the government after a long period of political turmoil. And uh, there was no justification for this military group. We are reviewing our military and other assistance and engagements consistent with uh, US law. And accordingly, the United States uh, government suspended the financial assistance to Thailand, disappointingly only 4.7 uh, million US dollars, basically it's very tiny, you know, it's almost, we don't, 
we almost feel nothing uh, about the, the, the soft sanction. Uh, and also uh, halt the uh, joint program uh, for uh, some sort of training uh, between uh, the, the two armies, the Thai army and the American army, and also uh, Thai police training as well, which included a firearm uh, handling and a trip to the United States for senior uh, officers. Already, you know, Thailand was excluded uh, not long after the coup. Thailand was excluded from uh, another important uh, military exercise uh, in the name of the Rim of Pacific Exercise or RIMPAC, which is the largest international military maritime exercise in the world. Uh, it was eventually held in June 2014 in Hawaii uh, in response to uh, the spiraling human rights abuses in the wake of the military coup. So Thailand was not invited for that particular uh, military exercise. Uh, in her interview, then American ambassador to Thailand, Christy Kenney, she uh, disclosed that uh, we take very seriously the whole human rights uh, aspect to this school in Thailand. One of the things our government has done is look at our military engagement. And in addition to sanctions, the United States adopted uh, several punitive measures to punish uh, the Thai military uh, government. On the 20th of June 2014, uh, Washington announced that owing to the continual allegations of human rights and human trafficking, especially uh, in the Thai sex and fishing sectors, Thailand was to be relegated to the lowest rank in the U.S. Uh, Trafficking in Person Report, or TPR. The same category as Thailand has been put in the same category, category as Syria, Iran, and North Korea. Okay. And this announcement was uh, another uh, blow to Thailand's reputation, and this could result in further sanction, economic sanction, uh, both at the government and business levels. It should also be noted that uh, during the U.S. Independent Day party right, hosted by Ambassador Kenny in Bangkok on the 4th of uh, July 2014, none of the coup makers were invited, uh, whereas you know, a lot of red shirt uh, personalities, including you know, famous law professor from Kamasad University, they were all invited to the Independent Day Party uh, in Bangkok. Uh, this was meant to send a strong message to the U.S. rejection of the coup. And now it is clear also that while the Coprango, uh, the largest military exercise between the United States and Thailand uh, in, the, in the Asia Pacific region, went on, it actually went on not long ago, I think a week or a you know, ago or last week, uh, it, it is clear that uh, the Cobra Bravo was downgraded, you know, as part of the U.S. soft sanction against Thailand. I think this is very important and uh, we should really, uh, pay attention to uh, this kind of downgrade of uh, Cobra Bravo because uh, it, it is, as I said, this is quite an important platform uh, of cooperation between the two countries. The Cobra Bravo was, was set up in 1980s, you know, served as a uh, very important platform, you know, where uh, now up to 13,000 American and Thai soldiers meet annually and conduct joint military exercises, bringing in, you know, large paychecks and also technological transfer to the Thai army. The downgrade uh, came after the uh, controversial visit of Daniel Russell, the U.S. Assistant Secretary to, uh, of State for East Asia, East Asian and Pacific Affairs in Thailand. I will elaborate on uh, the, the trip of uh, Daniel Russell to Thailand, I think later, later, but just to show you a photo right now. Uh, while uh, Daniel visited Bangkok, uh, he had a chance to talk to uh, the Foreign Minister General uh, 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 <laughs> I mean, he is so insignificant that I do not even remember his name. Uh, <laughs> but then I remember clearly this person who is Ding Lak uh, I mean, uh, a, a, a side uh, meeting uh, was also arranged between uh, Daniel Russell with uh, Ying Lak and also with Apisit Wei Cha I mean, this caused so much uh, uh, discontentment, you know, on the part of the of the coup, uh, the, the, the junta. Uh, but again, I will elaborate a little bit later. Now, looking at the American opposition toward Thailand, it's really trigger, you know, other democratic nation uh, to use uh, international sanctions as a way to pressure uh, the, the Thai junta to loosen its grip, you know, on power. After the United States, then we should briefly look into the case of the European Union. Uh, the EU initiated its own, also its own soft sanction against the NCPO, you know, by announcing that it would freeze ongoing bilateral cooperation 
including the suspension of all official visits to and from Thailand. No. In more specific details, the EU has halted the, uh, its partnership and cooperation agreement with Thailand, uh, which was uh, finalized in November 2013, but was yet to be ratified. It was supposed to be ratified uh, later, but I guess that, that has to be uh, postponed uh, for now. The, agree the, the agreement was designed to strengthen cooperation in a variety of sectors, you know, including uh, tourism, you know, employment, education, migration, transport, and environment. It's also aimed uh, to promote a political dialogue between the two sides. Additionally, and I think this is very important, the EU you know, has shelved the negotiations with Thailand on the Free Trade Agreement, FTA. Uh, bilateral trade between the EU and Thailand uh, stood at 32 billion euros or 42 billion US dollars in 2012, and I think it is growing until the coup of 2014. Uh, such a move, you know, the freezing of the FTA, uh, would cost Thailand many business opportunities in Europe. Uh, the EU also imposed a travel ban for all members of the NCPO. Uh, Prayut was able to travel to Italy, to Milan, but that was not a uh, bilateral visit. So that was a part of Thailand being a member of ASEM, uh, the Asia-Europe meeting. So that's why he was allowed into uh, Europe at that time. But otherwise, uh, Prayut should not be allowed into uh, Europe for a bilateral visit. Uh, the Council for European Union also released a statement you know, on the 23rd of June uh, urging the military to restore the legitimate democratic process and to respect and uphold human rights and fundamental freedom and free all political, political detainees failing, failing to do so you know, could cause further possible measures against the NCPO. Uh, the EU has been known for its periodic use of sanctions to address uh, a variety of issues, and mostly as we know, the EU uh, imposed sanctions, quite stiff sanctions against Burma and Myanmar before for uh, many, many years. Uh, in the context of Southeast Asia, the EU has long, as I said, in the case of Myanmar, uh, some said that it did not really work, you know, it fell. Uh, that remains to be seen in the case of Thailand. Uh, briefly, okay, this is, this is the thing in, in Milan, and then, uh, I think this photo uh, in particular. That lady is a uh, Kun Lek Chanya, who, uh, who, who is now seeking exile in, uh, in Finland. Uh, she just went there to Milan and then she stayed, managed everything by herself, you know, managed to uh, pull the, the, the protest, anti protest protests. Uh, everything came down to her, you know, to the success. Uh, and I was told that, you know, it, it was, it was uh, you know, she's the one who put all this anti protest sticker all over the city, you know, by herself. And she elaborated later that she only spent 500 euro to do that. So it's just such a small amount to kind of damage the reputation of Brazil. I think it's worth it. Uh, <laughs> meanwhile, you know, the Austrian government on, on the 30th, uh, 31st of May 2014 also issued a statement confirming the postponement of uh, bilateral military operation in Thailand. It also said that uh, Austria has postponed, you know, three activity, blah, blah, blah. So, uh, you would see that uh, there's a number of uh, Western countries, you know, the US, US, Australia, and also the EU, which have come up with a soft sanction against Thailand. I would see that is a kind of uh, an interventionist approach when it comes to Thailand. Basically, they just want to intervene into the crisis in Thailand so that they could uh, have some kind of influence over the regime. This is totally different from another set of relationship which Thailand had with other, other, uh, other country, uh, which I would see that this different approach is pragmatic approach by those countries. I will el el elaborate it now. So uh, with the soft sanction, uh, the Thai Junta has been forced uh, to find new alternatives uh, you know, in the country diplomacy instead of having to rely on the US, EU and Australia. One way for the Kunta to find this way out is to seek legitimacy from its neighboring countries, you know, in order to uh, counterbalance Western countries. And surely the Thai Kunta has found some comfort, you know, in the warm, embracing arms of China. Uh, this is, uh, I think this, this photo is quite uh, captivating, you know, in the sense that uh, you could see that the youth could be so humble, uh, so nice and cute, you know. Uh, so different from you know his kind of you know macho attitude you know, 
uh, when he was in Thailand. Uh, shortly after the coup, Prayut was shaking hand with uh, many many Chinese business owners, you know, demonst demonstrating the Thai tactic of using China to counterbalance Western sanctions. And China has a strictly upheld a non-interference policy vis-a-vis -vis Thailand. So I mean that could only be good for Thailand too, right? Leader in Beijing, you know, concentrate on making money and rather than making enemies. So uh, they are very happy to stay neutral you know, in Thailand's polarized politics, uh, uh, if not leading toward uh, the, the Thai junta. I would see this as China's pragmatic diplomacy throughout you know, the, the Thai crisis that we have been uh, you know, observing. Uh, and this stole yet another, another march you know, from the US invent, uh, interventionist approach. Uh, the Thai leader really feel more comfortable you know, uh, with China's position in the conflict. But you could not stop, you know, showing off his relationship, you know, with China. Chinese businessmen are keen to work with the Kunta. General Prayut, uh, Prayut Wong Suwan, Deputy Prime Minister and also Minister of uh, Defense, also paid a visit to uh, Beijing right after Taksin and Ying Lak went to Beijing, right, to strengthen bilateral ties. And at the end, China is willing to invest, you know, in a high high speed train project, uh, obviously with high interest and you know some issue of management. But I think China is not only Thailand uh, friend in time of crisis. You know, on the 4th of July, Myanmar uh, Supreme Commander Senior General Min Ong Leng okay, paid a visit to uh, Bangkok, and making, a, making him one of the first few leaders from ASEAN you know, to, to meet with the Thai Junta after the coup. He held a cozy discussion with Prayut, uh, supposedly to a strengthened relationship uh, between Thailand and Myanmar. This turbing leader, uh, Min Ong Leng, press you know the, the Thai Kunta for in bracket doing the right thing you know in staging the coup. So basically they said look guy this is good this is the way to do it. That's, that's like what we have been doing it for decades. You know in seizing, seizing power. He also compared uh, this country uh, experience during the political upheaval that took place in Yangon, you know in 1988 uh, when the Thai uh, the, the Myanmar army you know launched daily crackdown against pro-democracy activists. Uh, but Ming, uh, Ming Ong Leng's relationship with Thailand is more than skinny, and that's why I show this photo to you. He is the adopted son of uh, Thai military supremo, General Brian Vizulano, uh, the Thai uh, former Prime Minister and, and current President of the Privy Council. Uh, and while still in army, Brian personally know uh, Ming Ong Leng's father, so who is army chief of the uh, uh, the, the, the Myanmar army at the time. So the Thai kind of went back quite far and now they want to uh, kind of rekindle uh, that Thai once again. So uh, in 2012, Brian adopted uh, Min, Min Ong Leng as his son. Uh, it's, you never be old, too, too old you know, to adopt anyone, right? Uh, Min Ong Leng is a rising star in, in, in the Thai model and someone told me, it could be wrong, a possible candidate. <coughs> Uh, to be uh, president of Myanmar in the future, possibly. Uh, critics were too, too quick to uh, celebrate Myanmar in you know, the opening up process, but in, real, in reality, uh, Myanmar has yet to come out of the military shadow. 25% of parliamentary seats being reserved you know, for army uh, delegates. But I will not talk into detail uh, too much time. Uh, just basically want to say that uh, I think for Prayut to visit uh, Myanmar, I think maybe Prayut would hope to jump into a bandwagon band of Myanmar now being opening up and also get a lot of uh, world's attention. Uh, I think Thailand would might want to put itself into that situation that look, you know, whatever happened to Myanmar could also happen to Thailand too. You know, uh, Myanmar had long been uh, under the uh, military regime, but right now Myanmar is willing to reform. It's exactly like Thailand right now, you know, we are also willing to reform if you give up, give us some time. Uh, but then moving away from Myanmar, you know, such an, an alliance uh, would also uh, welcome a new member. Alliance between Thailand and Myanmar would also welcome a new member, and that was Cambodia. On May thirty first last year, you know, Cambodian Deputy Prime Minister and Defence Minister General Pia Ban, you know, also he half Thai, half Cambodian, uh, visited Bangkok and also expressed uh, his confidence in the leadership of uh, the Thai military in bringing peace and order to Thailand. Uh, the visit, visit to Thailand by a top you know, Cambodian delegate was politically meaningful in many, many ways. 
it could be used to repair the declining popularity of Hun Sen at home too, you know, by appearing to push for an improvement you know, in bilateral elections. As we know that uh, Hun Sen also <coughs> suffered so much from the previous election, right, when he uh, lost so much of a uh, parliamentary seat to the opposition. Uh, these follow years of conflict between uh, Thailand and Cambodia over the territorial uh, dispute uh, of the Prevy here and, uh, and the allegation of Hun Sen's support supporting a former Thai Prime Minister uh, Thaksin Shinawan and offering shelter to anti uh, obviously now to you know, sheltering a lot of Thai exiles in Cambodia. Uh, gradually, the political interest between Thailand, Myanmar and Cambodia seemed to converge and this is a photo of a meeting with uh, Hun Sen. I'm not sure whether, I mean, they definitely met in Milan, uh, and I think this photo was taken in Milan. Uh, now, the alliance between Thailand, Myanmar, and Cambodia, and also with the backing of China, I think the three states, or four of them, you know, in, in mainland Southeast Asia, have increasingly emerged as a large dark hole, you know, that could threaten democracy in the region. China has already successfully made and enrolled, you know, into Myanmar and Cambodia and now serve as Thailand legitimacy provider in defiance of international sanctions and the new alliance between Thailand and Myanmar, uh, Cambodia and China you know, could negatively affect uh, peace and stability in the Southeast Asian region. I will not talk about ASEAN because I think uh, it would be worth the time talking about the ASEAN role you know, in, the, in the support of Thai democracy uh, in, uh, in Thailand. I would jump into uh, the how the U.S. respond to uh, this emerging uh, mini block of, I would say, anti-democratic uh, movement in Thailand, uh, in the region between Thailand, Cambodia, Myanmar, and, and, and China. Uh, the U.S. has been uh, kind of like anxious about it, and uh, they might need to rethink the strategy of how to deal with uh, I mean, Thailand in particular and in the whole region, with China taking a lead, you know, in general. Uh, indeed, I think the U.S. has shown uh, it wanted to become more assertive, you know, in relationship with Thailand and also in the region. That's why last month, uh, U.S. Assess Assistant Secretary of State uh, Daniel Russell visited Thailand and met with, uh, as you see in the photo earlier, with uh, Tanasa, as well as Ying Lak and Prisip. His visit to Thailand turned a controversial after uh, he urged Thai military to leave uh, the martial law and to uh, return power to the Thai soon. Uh, also, his remark, you know, came in the aftermath of Ying Lak being impeached, you know, in a case of her mishandling uh, the rice pledging scheme. Observer believe that the U.S. want to send a strong message of its disapproval of the of the military government and uh, its slow political reform and also its harassment against the human rights uh, and human rights human right violation and also opposition. Immediately, uh, Russell comments were harshly you know, responded by Kun Da. Prayut called Russell's uh, action as intervention, interference into the Thai domestic affair. Meanwhile, you know, ultra uh, nationalists expressed their anger against the U.S. They stormed the Facebook page of a U.S. embassy in uh, Bangkok and also uh, the Facebook page of President Barack Obama sending repeat, repeated message, messages of Thailand being an independent country and will not take order uh, from the U.S. Some of them even wrote in Thai. I wonder whether Obama could understand it. Uh, but at the same time, you know, the, the Committee of Foreign Affairs has summoned the U.S. charged affair, uh, even when it has no right to do so. And eventually, uh, Patrick, uh, who is uh, the charged affair, re rejected uh, the, the invitation. Uh, I mean, this is uh, kind of like uh, confidential, but we might as well make it public. Uh, in return, the, the, the State Department in D.C. summoned the Thai ambassador in Washington DC of course and warned Thai ambassador that the drama you know could cause a huge impact on bilateral relations and this just happened not long ago. Uh, the US uh, current position uh, regarding the the Thai situation has uh, deeply if in infuriated uh, the leaders in Bangkok. They were you know surprised you know by the seemingly changing policy of the US government which has previously been open openly supportive of the traditional elite. We understand that throughout the Cold War, uh, the U.S. has forged a close alliance with the military, the bureaucracy, and also the palace in their, you know, combat against the communists. But these intimate ties, you know, were, however, coming to coming loose, you know, following the change of political landscape in Thailand in recent years as well. 
the US realized that there were new players uh, entering into the Thai broker domain who are not aligned, aligning themselves with the traditional elite. Therefore, we see the need to diversify its policy options and at least, you know, on the surface, reach out, you know, to the red shirt of faction as part of its obligation to promote democracy and more importantly, to ensure that it will not put all eggs in one basket. So instead of having to, you know, put all eggs into the basket of the traditional elite, they must well, you know, have to uh, look for other, other alternatives. And that's why Patrick Murphy, once again, the judge of the fair, uh, said it out loud that he would start to go out there to see red shirt uh, units, you know, network more and more and more. Again, you know, I argue that the U.S. has adopted an uh, interventionist approach in order to maneuver the Thai political situation uh, to its own advantages, and in doing so, has bef befriended, you know, as well as irritated, you know, both sides of the Thai of Thailand's conflict. For example, you know, why Russell Initiative uh, may have symbolized the U.S. sympathy toward uh, the pro-democracy movement. It was also evident that the U.S. has not cut all ties with the, with the military and the old power as well. As seen in the Cobra Braco, you know, the, the U.S. could stop Cobra Braco this year as part of its protest against the Thai government, but it allowed it to happen. And instead, uh, it, choose, it chose to downgrade uh, the exercise. Uh, this may also have upset uh, the opposition who feel that the U.S. could not be trusted at the end. Finally, why can't we have to talk about Japan? Because we are in Japan, right? Uh, uh, Japan also represents a source of legitimacy, you know, for the Thai military regime. Earlier, Japan also voiced its concern about the, the grave situation in Thailand. Foreign Minister Fumio, uh, Fumio uh, Kishida released a statement on the 27th of May on the day of the military coup, stressing that it was regrettable that the coup took place and urged that democracy should be restored, you know, uh, in the country quickly. Japan, you know, as a major trade, major a trading partner of Thailand, has been very careful in its policy toward, uh, toward the country. You know, although Japan has not imposed official sanctions against the junta, it was reported that you know, almost in the aftermath of the coup, that a study tour of a group of Thai police to Japan was cancelled almost at the last minute uh, because uh, of the coup, basically. Uh, but it seemed that Japan was shifting its position every now and then. You know, previous trip to Japan earlier in February, you know, from 8 to 10, uh, was widely publicized in Thailand as a success, you know, in getting recognition from one of the most powerful uh, economies in the world, basically Japan. While in Tokyo, uh, Prayut uh, discussed a deal with the Japanese government on a high-speed train project that involved the building of rail tracks uh, connecting Bangkok with Myanmar and Cambodia also known as the East-West uh, Corridor Rail, rail Link, as well as the state-of-the-art, you know, trains similar to the Shinkansen, you know. Prayut also took the Shinkansen, right, to the team, once again, nice and cute, uh, took the Shinkansen from Tokyo to Osaka uh, to experience a ride, you know, that will in the future be in service in Thailand too. The high-speed train project was the result of recent multiple meetings between Prayut and leaders to the Japanese government on the 27th of January, uh, Hiroto Isumi, who is a special economic advisor to Prime Minister uh, Shinzo Abe, uh, held a discussion with Prayut in Bangkok on high-speed train agreement. Prior to this meeting, Prayut also met with Abe in October 2014, once again in Milan, uh, at the uh, ASEM uh, meeting, uh, and also a second time at the summit of ASEAN uh, in Myanmar Nebido. I have to uh, make note here is that Japan is the only developed country which has multiple meetings with the Thai government. No other country apart from Japan. In November 2014, uh, well, obviously they also met at, at ASEAN and I think they have a, a private a bilateral talk. Japan has provided, you know, breathing speed, uh, space for the Thai general amid uh, this Western sanctions against the uh, military regime. Although the political drama in Thailand is far from over, a uh, Prayut trip to Japan earlier this month became a convenient break you know, from the heat of the Thai politics at home. Japan, Japan is not the only, only country which offers you know, uh, this special treatment to the Thai junta. China, as I mentioned earlier, is willing to 
ride your piggyback on the success of the rich regime and to help uh, raise your confidence in prolonging its rule in Thailand. And sadly, in my own opinion, Japan is following in the footsteps of China, which may not help improve the situation in Thailand.